Welcome everybody. Looks like we still have a few folks trickling in, but I'll go ahead and get started. So good afternoon and thank you all so much for joining us for today's webinar on mountain lions in an era of rapid climate and land use change. My name is Logan Christian, Region 2 Conservation Advocate for Mountain Lion Foundation, and it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Dr. David Stoner. Dr. Stoner is a research assistant professor and lecturer in the Quinney College of Natural Resources at Utah State University. And he's a graduate of the University of California and Utah State University. Over the past 25 years, Dr. Stoner has worked with state wildlife agencies in California, Utah, and Nevada on scientific investigations of mountain lions and their major prey species. He's currently focused on interactions between mule deer, mountain lions, and wild horses in the Southern Great Basin. And in fact, he recently presented initial findings from this work at the Nevada Department of Wildlife Commission meeting. It has been a pleasure getting to know Dr. Stoner since I first reached out to him this summer. As a fellow alumni of Utah State University, I was excited to connect and ask him about his extensive work investigating mountain lions, especially here in the more arid Western states that I oversee in my position. Dr. Stoner's willingness to explain his research has greatly improved my understanding of how mountain lions are responding to the many challenges and changing environmental conditions around us. We are so grateful for the time Dr. Stoner has put into preparing this presentation and his willingness to educate the public about this important topic. So on a quick logistical note, I know many of you have attended our webinars before, but in case this is your first time, we will be managing the Q&A with the raise hand function. So if you have a question, just click that raise hand button um, at the bottom of your screen and you'll be added to a key. And at the end of the presentation, we will call on you and, and unmute you when it is your turn to ask a question. So we look forward to having some great questions at the end. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Stoner. So thanks for being here, everybody. And thank you, Dr. Stoner. Okay, can you hear, hear and see me? Or at least see my slides? We can, yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks for having me, Logan. I, I appreciated talking to you about this subject uh, earlier this fall, and it, it really got me thinking about this question of climate change. It's, ironically, it's it's one of the one of the major topics is driving a lot of scientific investigations right now in ecology, and and yet it is. Uh, what I found was that some of the basic relationships between our, our focal wildlife species and climate are still in a state of infancy in terms of our understanding of how climate influences their movements, their demography, their behavior, and, and their survival. And I, I was very fortunate in that right after finishing my dissertation, I, I uh, obtained a, a postdoctoral fellowship with NASA where the question was, how can we use our, our imagery uh, that's being collected, satellite imagery about the earth and integrate it with wildlife management conservation broadly. And so we compiled a lot of data from a variety of sources in conjunction with a number of state agencies, primarily in Utah, Arizona, and Nevada, and then in partnership with the US Geological Survey to look at really fundamental questions of animal demography and climate in this backdrop of, of climate change and, of course, land use change. And so I want to start with this, is just this recognition that, that the human footprint on the planet is, is extraordinary and unprecedented. And species will vary in terms of how they react to this. And we see a, a major schism in that some are highly vulnerable and have become jeopardized by this, whereas others have others have um, adapted to this to these changes and are actually uh, benefiting immensely from from the uh, changes to the environment that human beings have have wrought. And it is, so I, I, I just want to put this thought out there that, that uh, species with a wide tolerance for, for both habitat 
uh, variability and, and human activities are, are in all likelihood those that are going to persist under this regimen of change, uh, very rapid change, and, and are likely to be driving the ecological interactions in the future. And my question up front, is the mountain lion a, a climate bellwether or is it perhaps a survivor and, and will it will adapt? And I, in today's talk, I want to just present some some findings, some of which have been published, others are still um, in a preliminary state and, and come back to this question at the end of the show. So keep in mind, the human population continues to grow. It is, uh, it is really uh, an impressive amount of growth and, and the land use change that it stems from that growth. Uh, moreover, in the Western states where most of our public lands are and open space, are in the drier half of the country. And so water management is a major part of this, which is important in terms of uh, human appropriation of, of a critical resource. And as it turns out, water turns is one of the primary uh, factors that explains a lot of the patterns we see in wildlife abundance and distribution. And we know that the climate is warming. This has been well documented now and well understood. Um, there are indications that precipitation may be declining. And, and then the projections are that we're gonna see more frequent drought of longer duration and greater magnitude. So water will be uh, the prevailing theme. It, it, it always has been, and that's only gonna become more so in the future. And in addition to this, what we're, what we're interested in is the variation in the timing and form of precipitation. And in all likelihood, this will be changing as well. And I, I offer this as an example, uh, just to think about, because it turns out there are a number of, uh, just the timing of precipitation is a strong predictor of, of certain patterns in animal abundance. Uh, what you're seeing here is a graph of snowfall. And all it shows is that between latitudes 33 and 43, which ranges from southern Arizona to about southern Idaho, roughly 40% of the annual precipitation comes in the form of winter snowpack. The other seasons show very strong patterns, uh, primarily summer, that summer is the, the time of um, precipitation in the Sonoran Desert. And as one moves forward, that declines in a linear fashion so that in Northern Utah and Southern Idaho, uh, summers are relatively dry and plants cannot depend on a, a pulse of summer moisture. Um, but in terms of springtime moisture, it's, it's fairly dry in the Sonoran and, and relatively wet in these, these, uh, the Southern Rocky Mountain ecosystems. And so what this leaves us with is a very strong latitudinal gradient in terms of the timing and amount of precipitation with these southern systems having a, a seasonal drought between the end of winter and the beginning of the, the summer monsoon, which typically begins roughly the middle of July. Um, whereas in these northern systems, it's really a fairly long, slow snow melt into warm, wet springs and drying in the summer. We'll come back to this in a moment, but the point being um, these patterns in precipitation are likely to have very strong influences on Western ecosystems. So one of the things I'd, I'd like to start out with, this talk is focused on the mountain lion and th these animals really have an interesting position in the scheme of things. And I, I think it was really nicely summarized by E.O. Wilson in this quote in which he says, top carnivores are predestined by their perch at the apex of the food web to be large in size and sparse in numbers. They live on such a small portion of life's available energy as to always skirt the edge of extinction. And they are the first to suffer when the ecosystem around them starts to erode. And what he meant by this is that these animals they're the race cars of the of the wildlife community. They require jet fuel to run, and they they are uh, very potentially very sensitive to fluctuations in the environment. So 
from a scientific standpoint or looking at some basic ecology, this is what I mean. And we go back to the principle of uh, what's called the 10% rule in terms of the amount of energy that is, moves across trophic levels. With the sun being the ultimate source, plants being photosynthetic and able to convert some small percentage of that uh, solar radiation into biomass that is then available for other organisms, consumers. And so what we see is that this movement across trophic levels diminishes at an exponential rate. So that if only 2% of sunlight is converted into veg vegetative biomass, from there, only about 10% of the plant biomass is converted into uh, that of primary consumers, such as the mule deer here, 10% into a secondary consumer, and 10% of that. So we see a diminishing amount of this energy is diminishing. Now, this varies in both space and in time. So in the example of a wet year, we get good primary production. This can be exploited by animals and converted into young juveniles. Conversely, in a dry year or drought conditions, uh, one of the first metrics in, in animal demography we see is a reduction in juvenile survival. So in plain language, what this means is that minor perturbations to the plant community or the primary production have this magnifying effect as they move up across trophic levels. And so this formed the, the background or the, the theory that we built some of our studies on was this magnification of impacts to vegetation across trophic levels with the mountain lion being at the very pinnacle of this as a large bodied obligate carnivore. So this is what we know. This is the status quo. Climate predictions suggest warming and drying. Uh, there's a lot more uncertainty about uh, precipitation, but the initial indications are that we will see drying and, and certainly greater variability, greater um, variation between years, dry years and wet years. And that this seems to be playing out right now. And I wanna go back just a little bit and say that when we talk about climate change and its impacts on species, these are broad scale questions and where, where we're looking for these impacts is in their distribution and abundance. So how do they vary in terms of their ranges? How, how do the ranges change? How does abundance within the range change in response to these changes in climate? Now, again, with the mountain lion as our focal animal, the things we should be looking out for are thresholds in prey abundance. So these are carnivores. They depend on, uh, they are secondary consumers. They depend on other animals to survive. And so things that affect their prey base will affect them. Uh, moreover, there's this habitat component. They need some kind of vegetative structure to hunt. And then behind all this, we have land use change brought about by, by uh, human demographic trends, uh, changes in, in where people are living. And, and it's interesting in this era of Corona that uh, what these small Western towns are seeing is radical growth as uh, there's a massive shift in population and people capitalizing on the ability to telecommute and, and move out of cities. Uh, so these trends have been going on for decades. They have accelerated recently. But these are the three things that we have to keep in mind when we're thinking about this particular species. Well, what do mountain lions need to survive? They need food. Let's start at the start. Food is what drives everything about their behavior and their survival. And they will eat just about everything. If you read uh, the scientific literature, it's, it's almost hard not to find a... Uh, uh, who's who of the, the, the animal kingdom in their diets. But really it boils down to this, the, the deer, uh, mule deer, and, and to some degree white tails as well, uh, but otocoilids, um, and even more specifically, the, the juveniles, uh, as this picture illustrates. This, these deer make up somewhere between half to 80% of the diet, and they offer us a great deal of predictive power in terms of trying to evaluate how mountain lions will be impacted by changes in their environment is deer. Uh, 
they also need habitat. And the interesting thing about this species is that its habitat requirements are very broad. They're uh, very general. Uh, I, I like to say that they need food in a way of catching the food. That's really what it, it boils down to uh, for these animals. And there's some work by Carbone and Gittleman that really nicely summarized this in terms of uh, the den carnivore density as a function of prey density. So it, this again is our ability to evaluate these, these systems and look at uh, or have a, uh, an index of how the lions will be affected is through their, their prey. Importantly, this is also a species that exhibits one of the widest latitudinal distributions, uh, certainly in the Western hemisphere for a, a terrestrial animal. Um, they occur from Patagonia all the way up into central Canada and, and across this spectrum, they occupy a number of different biomes, plant communities, ranging from tropical rainforests to, to deserts and everything in between. And so they are not really associated with any certain plant community. They're, they're highly generalized and this offers them a lot of resilience to change, is this, this flexibility. Uh, we'll come back to this, but really it's food and the ability uh, or the, the topographic or vegetative structure that allows them to catch the food. Okay. So with that said, when we began this study, we, again, we were after some very large scale patterns in looking at climate and weather and its effects on primary production. And, and there was a whole other side of this project that dealt with the remote sensing and the vegetation components. But we, we started with the assumption that climate is the ultimate driving factor in terms of consumer abundance and distribution. And that this was our, our we took this as axiomatic that climate was impacting vegetation and, and through its impacts on vegetation, there would be subsequent impacts on the consumers that relied on that. From a management standpoint, you know, climate is just something we live with. We, we have no ability to manipulate it, but we do have some degree of ability to manipulate uh, the, the, uh, the habitat structure and the consumers. Now, all that said, we recognize there are these uh, biotic interactions between consumers and their food resources, but we were not focused on this. This is not to say that they don't occur, simply that they are, we considered these to be entrained in this larger system. So this is part of the unexplained variance in our models. This really was climate focused. Okay, so with that said, what would we expect in terms of how climate would influence deer? Uh, this is gonna be our major um, predictor in terms of impacts on mountain lions. And we, we assume that it was a, a direct effect or, or fairly close. The deer is an herbivore. It depends on vegetation. Vegetation is going to be strongly influenced by variation in precipitation. And this should play out in terms of the total production, the plant community composition, uh, growing season length, and these are going to influence uh, aspects of reproduction and survival. And those in turn are going to influence or uh, uh, predict changes in distribution and abundance. So I wanna start with uh, a description of plant phenology as measured by NDVI. NDVI is a, a satellite derived index of primary production and it's measuring reflectance from plants. Uh, so photosynthetic materials are, are put, um, reflecting certain wavelengths that we can use to measure uh, production. And so I'm gonna show you three curves here. This first one is from about 41 degrees north latitude, uh, which is roughly where I live. Um, think of it as the northern border of California, uh, Mount Shasta roughly, uh, in terms of latitude. And what you see is a, a strong peak. This is driven by winter snowpack, spring snow melt, and it tapers off. And this corresponds to the blue, the blue areas on the map here, just indicating a, a snow dominated precipitation regime 
and the plants are responding to that precipitation pattern. The yellow band is really marks a halfway. These are plant communities that are do have winter snowpack, but also get a fair amount of summer rain. And so you can see from this much broader um, growing season that you have a longer, flatter trajectory. Uh, the plants are coming out of out of winter into spring uh, based on uh, moisture in the soil from snowmelt and then receiving the subsidy uh, with the monsoon. And that refers to the beige color polygons in the map. Lastly, we have what, what we call the monsoonal signal. And these are plant communities that really are strongly driven by summer moisture. What I want you to take from this is these are very readily distinguishable from one another. And that this is really uh, largely just a matter of the timing and form of precipitation that these communities have uh, different uh, starts and ends to the growing season. The length of the growing season differs and the animals are responding to these uh, quite, uh, quite notably. Now these bands, these thick bands you see refer to the birthing season for mule deer. So the, the irony here, or one of the surprise results was that it was the deer in the northern part of our study area that were birthing the soonest, and those in the southern end were, were latest. Um, but what we found was the deer simply waiting to they give birth between the start of the growing season and the peak. So they're trying to um, uh, drop their fawns at a time when the, the food, the, the forage availability is, is rising on a daily basis and is at its um, annual peak in terms of quality, the succulence of the forage, largely the herbaceous component. So keep this in mind as we walk through this next slide. Again, the same latitudinal uh, transect, uh, southern Arizona to southern Idaho. And looking at the mean fawn production, these are data we obtained from state agencies on their fawn counts. And I have added Arizona and Utah together. I expected to see a clear break. Uh, and what we found was that it, they, they, it was a seamless transition. <clears throat> in a very strong pattern. Again, think about what's behind this. These Arizona systems, Southern Arizona are driven by monsoonal moisture, which, is, which varies in magnitude, it varies in timing, it varies in intensity, and there's a lot of local variation. And the consequence of this is that uh, font survival is lower at least neonatal font survival is lower. These counts are made in the fall. And so what we're seeing then is that in these snow driven systems in the northern part of our study area, fawns are surviving the winter, uh, pardon me, the summer uh, at higher rates than those that are born in these monsoonally driven systems. Part of this is that the snowy systems are much more rhythmic. They're much more predictable. The start of the growing season in Northern Utah is about the middle of June, give or take one week. By con in contrast, in the Sonoran Desert, it's uh, late July, give or take a month. So for an animal that's timing its birth to a, a, a point when it needs food, it's at its um, energetic demands or an annual high. Uh, at birth and the demands of lactation to feed that fawn, uh, food is critical. And so the predictability of it is predictable or uh, critical and therefore uh, fawn survival rates um, vary according to the, the uh, phenology of the plants in that system. You know, here's another way to look at it. We can look at interannual variation and the, the green line just represents the peak of the growing season, NDVI measured at its peak across uh, eight years in the western part of Utah. These are all management units that are, uh, they're in the driest part of the state. So this is the most water stressed part of the state. The gray line represents the fawn counts and they are tracking in unison. In other words, the, the water year is predicting uh, fawn production and or uh, summer neonatal survival very well in this water stressed system. 
This is another evaluation of how deer are impacted by climate. This is just looking at the, uh, what we call the, the foraging radius. So it's a, a home range measured on uh, just an, uh, semi-weekly intervals showing this strong linear pattern that as uh, NDVI as an index of primary production increases, the deer have smaller foraging radii or smaller home ranges. They don't need to go as far to meet their nutritional needs. Okay, so keep that in mind. Remember, the deer, it really is the basis of the mountain lion economy. They need um, an ungulate of this size to survive, uh, to persist. They, they do eat other things, um, but the mule deer really is the, the perfect prey species. So we expect that some of these, these patterns we see driven by climate are potentially going to transfer across trophic levels. But again, the mule deer is an herbivore. It's directly tied to vegetation. Mountain lions as a carnivore. We should see some attenuation of these effects. So correlated, but perhaps with a, a, a weakening of that correlation. Mountain lions should be affected indirectly, as I said, changes in prey availability and therefore habitat quantity, quality. And then connectivity is really uh, more of our land use component. How can these animals move in response to the changing distribution of their primary prey resources? And that should give us, this is what we're looking for, changes in abundance of distribution. Okay, I'm gonna show you two perspectives on the relationship between mountain lions and mule deer, both drawn from Western ecosystems. The first one is my own work. This was the work we published several years ago showing the correlation between mule deer abundance and mountain lion abundance. Again, we expected an attenuation, uh, but what we found was this very strong relationship. So we've got the peak is the NDVI measured at the peak of the growing season. Think of those curves I just showed you and the highest point on each one of them. And a commensurate index of uh, mule deer density and mountain lion density. The mule deer in the solid line, the mountain lion in the dashed line. And what I want you to take away from this is that in these drier systems, you know, looking at this all the way across to more productive systems, the density varied, uh, much lower densities in the dry areas getting higher, but the ratio between the two species remained constant. This was again, a surprise. And, and we've taken a lot of heat because you've got other, other prey species in the mix. They're elk, they're bighorn sheep, they're livestock, there are other things that they're eating, but nevertheless, the abundance of mule deer really um, was a very strong predictor of mountain lion abundance. And that ratio averaged one, one lion per 370 deer. Now, don't, don't take that to the bank, but it, it is uh, a, a rough index of this, this ratio. Now, another study uh, conducted in Eastern California uh, by the California Department of Fish and Game looked at the two species across time. So just one study area, but looking across uh, over 20, 20 years of of counting the two species together. This is a really interesting story here because fluctuation in climate is at the root of it. In the mid eighties, deer abundance was at a high. This was a west wide phenomenon. It was the product of several back to back, very wet years that allowed range conditions to support a higher abundance of mule deer. Um, beginning in the early nineties, a drought set in and we saw a crash in the deer population. Now, unfortunately, the lion component of the study was not added until several years later. So we've, we've got this period of missing data. Uh, but what we found was that the lions were at a high and their, their, their population followed this identical trajectory, suggesting that this, their abundance was closely tied to their uh, mule deer prey base. Uh, but with what was an astounding, uh, a long lag of seven or eight years, uh, the reaction of the, the lions to the crash in their prey base. 
And so over this interval, this is a plug for long-term studies, um, we saw the ratio of lions to deer go from a low of one lion per 167 deer um, to one per 2,000. So there's tremendous, you know, when I say don't, this 370 number is, is really more of a, a rule of thumb. It just recognize that in time, there's gonna be tremendous variation. But again, this is all tied back to uh, broad patterns in precipitation in this Great Basin sagebrush dominated system uh, with uh, an herbivore and a carnivore. Uh, so we've got a, a really close tie uh, of these consumers to rainfall, rainfall and snowpack. Okay. So if we've got this ratio, we can actually use this to model distributions and look at where these animals may be distributed and, and at what densities. So one of the other things that we looked at through this NASA project was how are the mountain lions, how much space do they require across a range of different ecosystems of varying productivity? So what you're seeing here are average home range sizes measured during the growing season across a number of populations in Arizona, Utah, in Nevada. And we have this, again, a very strong linear relationship with those animals in these dry desert systems um, having really exceptional home ranges. These are quite large, all the way down to those that are much smaller. And here's just a, a photo example of this, that um, we've got the sheep range, which is just north of Las Vegas. On the dry end of the the speed, we see this is likely the edge of their distribution in terms of a system that is just barely able to support a top carnivore um, because the productivity is so low. It also was very educational for me. I did my my dissertation work in the Ochre Mountains near Salt Lake City, which is right next to the Great Salt Lake, which adds this massive pulse of winter moisture. Why we have the ski areas there. Uh, you have this lake effect. So right around the lake is a uh, uh, it's an oasis. And I, this is this is where I was working the Garden of Eden for mountain lions. The deer densities are so high. Okay, so here are a couple of examples. This these are both adult females, and I want you to notice that they're both on the same scale. Okay, the identical scale. This is our sheep range female. She used the entire study area, uh, an annual home range of almost 800 square kilometers. This is a female in the Ochre Mountains where I worked 70 square kilometers. Um, so this is how the spatial requirements vary as a function of uh, climatically driven changes in primary production. And then just for kicks, here are some males. This is a male in our uh, Southern Utah study area. He only used 400 square kilometers. This one uh, from the, it was originally collared uh, in the Nevada test site. So another uh, very uh, arid, uh, part of the arid uh, side of the species distribution <laughs> uh, used upwards of 6,500 square kilometers. Um, and what's exceptional about this, well, even the small one, both of these home ranges are visible at the scale of the entire Western United States. And, and so I, I want you to appreciate how much space these animals require, e even under the best of conditions. Okay, so going back to our ratio, uh, we could ask the question, and, and this is leading into questions of conservation and protected areas and how much space constitutes is uh, adequate to support a, a breeding population. Uh, how much space is required to support 370 deer if, this, if we use this as our, our rule of thumb? Well, we know mule deer density increases with primary production. Even though NDVI cannot discriminate uh, what plants are palatable, which ones are accessible, it's, it's acting as a very good index of the total production of the system. 
And so we have, this is what I showed you earlier, the um, relationship between Mueller density and NDVI. Again, uh, this is my old study area in the Ochres, the Garden of Eden, and then a, a site in Southern Utah. And the question, how much space is required? Well, we have this uncanny uh, correlation to our mountain lion home ranges. So even taking a, a slightly different perspective on this, in the Ochres, it takes about 60 square kilometers to support three to 400 deer on the Kaparowitz Plateau in the southern part of the state, it, it, it takes up to 1,500. So uh, these, these are measures that are useful in terms of land management, in terms of protected area status, perhaps the role of parks, for instance, or even game management units in trying to capture how many animals are, um, are can a, a given area sustain. Okay, so let's step back for a moment. We've got uh, these strong relationships between climate and the abundance of our two focal species. Uh, we've got predictions for a drying and warming climate. Um, and these all have implications for the distribution of these species. And there are two models out there that explain how species contract. One, I'll just call it the climate hypothesis. It, it could be called the habitat quality hypothesis. Um, and this is an example using the scissor-tailed flycatcher, a bird indigenous to the southern Great Plains, with the, uh, the light gray representing the extent of its, its distribution under the best of times, and then the, the uh, black polygons representing the core of its range. And so as climate um, changes for the worse and the range of that species contracts, it tends to contract into the best habitats, those that are the most productive, that meet the, um, the most dimensions of its ecological niche. So this is really uh, what we could expect uh, if, if, if range contractions were purely driven by climate. Now, about 20 years ago, Channel and Loma Lino put forth a hypothesis they called contagion. Um, it's based on the distribution of human activities and human land use change and how human beings can actually drive species contractions. And what they found was that there are many species, those that are particularly sensitive to human uh, ne negative interactions with humans or uh, with competing uh, habitat needs, tend to contract away from human activity into remote areas. So it was more remoteness that predicted where they would end up. And here, uh, the red wolf is an example of that. When uh, there were efforts to reintroduce the red wolf, they looked at where it ended up and they said, well, it was in the swamps of Louisiana. They must like swamps. Well, it wasn't that, that, that the red wolf likes swamps so much as it is that uh, those are difficult landscapes for humans to um, to uh, do much with, they, they were they had no real agrarian value or development value, so they were the last ones to be to be uh, exploited in any way. And so our animals, our focal animals, were then contracting into remote areas rather than the highest habitat quality. So we can ask, you know, how how does how do these two models of range contraction? Uh, what what can we learn from them about mountain lions? And as it turns out, we, uh, we have examples of both of them. Uh, the climate hypothesis is played out, and this was uh, work done by Melanie Culver, uh, using DNA to, um, she hypothesized that uh, during, at the end of the Pleistocene, uh, Puma Concolor, what we call the mountain lion, uh, had occurred in North America, but had gone extinct in North America uh, with all the, um, ice age um, herbivores that, that had also gone extinct and that their range contracted into Central and South America. And as climatic conditions changed, they actually recolonized North America based on this refugium in the southern part of their range. So again, think back to my initial description of their distribution. This offers a lot of resilience. This species was able to recolonize um, as conditions warranted because of this um, broad 
uh, habitat tolerance in this, uh, in this niche. However, if we look at things in more, uh, more modern times, what we see is an example of the contagion hypothesis. So the mountain lion occurred coast to coast at the time of, of European contact. And in the two to 300 years, um, that range had contracted westward into the Rocky Mountains. This was largely an artifact of deforestation, overexploitation of white-tailed deer, which were being harvested as a food resource, and then direct exploitation of the mountain lions themselves. Um, note that that range contraction stopped at the Rocky Mountains. Again, it's this remoteness element. There's rugged terrain, it's inaccessible, it's of lower utility for human purposes, and therefore it offered uh, a sanctuary or a safe haven. And we, we know that this, the dark green now represents the current distribution of the species. There is more to the story, we'll touch on that moment toward momentarily. I want to, uh, f for, before that though, I, I want to touch on this aspect of connectivity. Keep in mind, this is a subject that could we could dedicate an entire webinar to. There's a lot to it, but I want to start with this, the innate dispersal tendencies of this particular species. So this map illustrates some data that we collected a number of years ago of an animal, a young female we collared, uh, just west of Salt Lake City. Over time, she vanished. Um, she turned up a year later in Western Colorado. Um, this was when we were first starting to put GPS units out and, and we were able to track her movements um, in hindsight. It, it, some in, really interesting things came out of this that I, I want you to, to think about or, or just chew on for a while in terms of what what really constitutes a barrier? What constitutes connectivity for a mountain lion? We see that she crossed Interstate 15 right here. Note that there is both an overpass and an underpass at that, that site. Um, she did not cross Interstate 70, whether this is because she got hung up or just settled in, we, we don't know. Um, this, this stretch of interstate is quite permeable. Nevertheless, she turned around and subverted the entire Wasatch Front. So we talk about metro areas as a barrier. She just walked around the entire thing, which is easily 100 miles long from Provo to Ogden. She then went up here. She crossed the High Uinas by walking over a 12,000 foot pass in summertime, uh, drifted around Wyoming for a while, but ultimately crossed the Green River three times. Now, by what, you know, the Green River is arguably not the biggest barrier, but it does suggest some ability to, to navigate uh, bodies of water. So keep this in mind, um, connectivity is still an evolving concept, I think, for this particular species. Um, there are examples where it, it, it is, there's some pretty clear barriers, and I'll show you some here. Um, when we talk about range contractions and extirpation, island populations are always at the top of the list of vulnerability. So here's some examples of island populations that vary in their degree to which they are vulnerable to climate change. Um, the first one here is Vancouver Island in Southern Canada. Um, from a climate change standpoint, I would say uh, this population is, is safer. This is a very large island, um, therefore has a relatively larger population. It's also very steep. So fluctuations in sea level are gonna be less uh, influential than they might be elsewhere. <clears throat> and, and should we ever go back into an ice age, it might even connect to the mainland, who knows? So we've, we've got um, more resilience here. Two examples of populations in California where the, the main constraint is not um, water, but is, is urban sprawl and freeways where we have uh, really small populations that are virtually surrounded by human activities and, and uh, high volume freeways. Uh, so again, our, our, our threat is you know, climate may have an influence, but here the problem really is land use. It is very clearly a, a land use problem more so than climate. 
and then lastly, the Florida panther, this, this relic population on the East Coast has got the double whammy. It sits on a, on a peninsula surrounded by water. To the north of it is a lot of um, our urban land uses and highways. And Florida is in the process of becoming a sandbar. Uh, in 100 years, it probably will not be above water. So uh, the Florida population really is in a deterministic sense, very vulnerable and, and is, is perhaps a, uh, 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 its days are numbered. These California populations, their efforts to mitigate some of this through overpasses, you know, very expensive options, but, but at least um, an available option for mitigating this, uh, whereas Florida really is, uh, uh, there are not many, not a whole lot we can do there. Okay, I want to leave uh, a couple couple more items here. Uh, this is a map of mule deer distribution. So going back to a purely climate based uh, view of habitat and animal abundance, what you're looking at here is not just distribution but also abundance or density. Uh, the white represents areas that are outside of the ecological niche. Mule deer are largely absent from the white areas. Blue, they are present at low densities with the yellow and red uh, corresponding to uh, increasingly higher densities. So this is all done with NDVI. And what we did was we developed a, a, uh, a threshold here. So for mule deer, the threshold is 0.28. That, that doesn't mean a whole lot, except that 0.28 really corresponds to where the white meets the blue. And so as that contour changes, we should expect mule deer abundance and distribution to change with that, pardon me, 0.15. I'll get to 0.28 in a minute. Uh, the 0.15 NDVI contour, uh, is where we should see real changes in terms of distribution of mule deer being on the edge of their, their range, their niche, their ability to occupy a given ecosystem. Now, the mountain lion we've uh, established is, is um, strongly correlated with mule deer and its distribution is really a subset of the mule deer. So it's, it overlaps, it's very similar, but it is not quite as expansive. And so this is where we expect changes to occur is the expansion or contraction of this, where the blue meets the white in terms of uh, shifts related to uh, climatic stress. Uh, wetter, conceivably, if we had wetter conditions, that blue zone would expand. Drier, it should contract. Um, so this gives us a place to start and to start thinking about um, these changes in abundance and distribution uh, in, in the, the arid parts of the West. These are some last thoughts I want to leave you with. Um, we've, we've looked at um, wildland systems. We've looked at climate. Going back to human impacts on the environment, one of the things or the primary thing that we do as a species is we stabilize the environmental variance in a given system that we occupy when we do that um, through making developments largely with water uh, bringing in irrigation um, we also have animals and this is very uh, domestic animals that is this can be an attractant to wildlife. And so one of the studies we did with NASA funding was looking at the role of light pollution. This is a whole study on its own. Um, I'm not going to get into a whole lot of detail here other than to say what we found was that mule deer in these uh, peri-urban environments show a very, very strong attraction to um, human land uses, be the agrarian or suburban and uh, actually showed a strong attraction to light. Uh, we think that that's because it expands their foraging period. It, it is essentially an artificial way of expanding the crepuscular realm. And in response, our mountain lions uh, showed the same pattern. Uh, this, the response to light was weaker, but attract 
deer. And these green dots and these maps show the locations of mountain lion kills uh, on the periphery of two Western cities. Uh, so the point here being that mule deer are attracted to urban environments, regardless of the level of human activity and the mountain lions are, um, whether it's reluctant or not, uh, they are capitalizing on this highly predictable resource. And so as conditions change, um, our, our human environments offer an oasis. They're very stable, very predictable, and um, animals are responding to that. And so this is where I think our, we, we need a third hypothesis about range contractions. Uh, this is the inverse of the contagion. The contagion is about remoteness. Uh, some of these species that are capable of tolerating human activities are potentially going to be expanding along lines of, of human um, land use. Here's some data to support that. This is a project I was involved in in the Bay Area where we uh, use camera traps to evaluate body condition scores in mountain lions. And again, a surprising result was that we found the highest body condition scores were among those animals that were photographed in areas of, of what we called uh, not mixed land use, but light light land conversion. So in other words, <clears throat> those animals photographed in wilderness areas or, or relatively intact systems were in poorer conditions, as were those that were really close to cities. But those in these marginally modified environments, think of this as agriculture, um, but also, also cemeteries uh, in, in urban uh, parks, showed slightly better body condition. This was um, one of these results you don't expect, but in hindsight makes a lot of sense because that's also where we, we photograph the, the highest uh, frequency of, of deer occurrence. Okay, so with, with that in mind, um, I, I, I wanna uh, bring this to a close and I want you to think about the whip as a metaphor in terms of mountain lions and their reaction to climate and climate change. Think back to Wilson's quote about these apex predators being um, the, the last to arrive in a system and the first to, to depart. Um, so I, I use the whip as an example because of, of slight flick of the wrist on one end results in a loud crack at the other end. And so again, we could think of this in space, we could think of it in time. With the temporal example, you know, our, our flick of the wrist is a series of good, big winners, lots of precipitation. Range conditions flourish. In response, our herbivores have high reproductive rates. And in response, our predator that relies on these juvenile ungulates um, needs less space to survive. Conversely, under conditions of drought, we see range conditions are um, uh, poor and that herbaceous layer is starved. And in response, um, our reproductive rate in our herbivores declines and we see a uh, need for greater uh, space. Spatial requirements expand under these conditions. So going back to our original question, is the mountain lion a bellwether of climate or is it a survivor? It is never gonna be a bellwether in the sense that a polar bear or a pika are. These are species where just the variable temperature has tremendous predictive power about their, their range, their distribution and the status of their habitat. The mountain lion is, is not that. Nevertheless, um, it may have other vulnerabilities and there are other ways it will be affected by climate change. So with this, I, I, this is a map of mule deer distribution in North America. And right now, the mountain lion distribution again is a subset of mule deer distribution. And what we see is news coming out of our northernmost state of deer starting to colonize parts of it, suggesting that the uh, mule and, and white-tailed deer 
are expanding northward into the boreal forest. And in fact, I have colleagues that uh, helped on this NASA project that are in the process of publishing a paper on the uh, actually mapping and measuring the movement of the boreal forest northward, which is can be also read as a contraction of Arctic ecosystems. So our more temperate um, animals associated with the temperate zone are expanding northward. We see this in white-tailed deer, um, and in this case, they say land use is secondary. I, I urge caution. There are clearly examples where land use is actually primary in our more heavily developed areas. Um, and in response to that, we're seeing movement of mountain lions into areas where they, they have been extirpated uh, for decades, if not centuries, and, and even some movement into the far north. So there is potential um, expansion on the, nor the northern end of the range. But again, going back to this, this urban question, you know, what can we expect in the future? And I, I think this is really the more pressing part and why, uh, although our mountain lion is not a climate bellwether, it, it may, it has other um, vulnerabilities because of its, its attraction to deer in urban areas and the, <clears throat> the um, appropriation of resources in human dominated environments that make agriculture in urban areas attractive to wildlife. Um, the mountain lion has a, a real uh, public relations problem and it's the tolerance in urban areas is quite low. So um, as I say, it may not be vulnerable to climate directly, but its attraction to urban areas may be uh, where it is more vulnerable. So I'd like to leave you with just a few thoughts, um, some summary points here. Um, the, the mountain lion is likely to contract to some degree in these arid zones, though I would add there's a, uh, there are uh, some caveats there, alternative prey resources in those dry zones may actually um, make it a very interesting situation. And as, as uh, Logan alluded to, I'm working on this uh, project in Nevada about horses a, as an alternative resource, and they are not nearly as sensitive to climatic variation as our mule deer. And so even in these arid zones, there are probably going to be uh, refugia uh, where the mountain lions will, will persist. Um, expansion northward into the boreal forest. I, I think we can uh, probably bank on that. And then this idea of urban areas uh, being an attractant. This goes into these ideas of ecological traps or sink populations. There's a lot of food, but there's also there are also high mortality rates, and the degree to which that may influence their uh, their uh, livelihood or or their uh, prospects in certain environments. Uh, we've we've got the double whammy here. The climate is drying, and we've got more people and more demands for the natural resources. And so these are a few things that I, th I think we should watch out for. One, uh, that larger larger home ranges again as as food resources diminish, they need to compensate by expanding their home ranges. And these this expansion is happening over a fragmented environment uh, where there's just more potential for interaction with, with people and highways. Um, in, the, in dry areas or highly variable areas, uh, we are likely to see a greater reliance on human resources. And this is just the nature of what we have done, the consequence of what we have done to the landscape by making it stable and attractive uh, for our own purposes that has not gone unnoticed by wildlife. And unfortunately from this will we'll stem uh, conflict. So even if the overall population is lower than ever, we may see increases in conflict because of this attractiveness. Now, again, some caveats here. Um, the mountain lion has a very wide, very broad habitat tolerance, and there's gonna be tremendous um, heterogeneity in, in terms of how they are impacted um, across that range from not at all to heavily. Um, and then this this um, question of human tolerance, this, this is always uh, really the, the, um, 
the wild card in all of this. So that is what I have to offer today. I'd be happy to entertain some questions and, and I do wanna uh, thank my sponsors and colleagues and associates in this um, uh, from, from NASA and the, the states of Utah, Nevada and Arizona and uh, some of my uh, university colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. And again, we're going to move to Q&A now. So go ahead and raise your hand if you have a question. All right, we have a couple, we have one question right now. Uh, Catherine, please ask your question. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, great. I actually have two specific questions. Uh, in one of your early screens showed how mountain lions had retreated, or cougar, I should say, had retreated into South America during the last ice age and repopulated after the last glacial maximum. And they were coast to coast in North America then. And then you said that they had contracted with human contact. Were you talking about human contact as North America was initially peopled? around 14, 15,000 years before present, or were you talking about post-European contraction when they were you know, sport hunted or just hunted because they wanted to get rid of the vermin? That's oh, yeah, I, I, sorry, I, I, if I wasn't clear, I meant European contact. Oh, good, okay, thank you, that, yeah. was, that was clear. So, so there was no contraction while Native Americans were hunting deer throughout the continent. Well, I, I can't really comment on that. I, I don't I don't know. Um, well, what I, we know are these very broad patterns in species extinction at the end of the ice ages that were largely brought about by changes in plant communities. Um, mm -hmm. And as a top carnivore, presumably their 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 prey species were affected by that. The uh, yeah, so I, I'm not aware of any any. Uh, evidence about extirpations during the you know, pre-European era. Okay, well, um, second, the second question is on one of your um, early screens, you also showed the, the, ex the range of lion populations and you had one little one up in New England. There seemed to be a circle with an arrow. Is there now a resident population in New England? <laughs> You've got a very keen eye for detail. Yeah, I do. Uh, I'm a linguist. I, I work with detail all the time. Let me see. Um, oh, yeah. I don't know what that is. I No, I would ignore that. Sorry. Um, I know there, there have been ones that have shown up in Pennsylvania and Connecticut and then have been killed in one way or another. So. Yeah, there's uh, so uh, something to keep in mind is that uh, the, the states vary in terms of their the legal status of having exotic pets such as big cats. Mm. Um, they, and, you know, people s let them go. You do, you, we know a few have uh, dispersed from the West and ended up there, but I am not aware of any reproducing population or any relic population out on the East Coast other than in Florida. Okay, well, thank you and so in much. In fact, I, I worked with a, a state biolo predator biologist from Maine and he, he had uh, very clear words on that. I won't repeat them here, but the answer was no. Good. Well, thank you. It was fascinating. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Okay. We have one question that came in through chat. It says, do you think the advent of wolves from Asia could have temporarily extirpated mountain lions from North America? And it says that wolves, you know, definitely kill mountain lions. So. <sighs> Oh, uh, anything I said on that would be pure speculation. Yeah. All I can go to is to say that uh, wolves and mountain lions occupy a very similar niche. And what ecological theory tells us is that when the niche is the same, it will either be split or one species will 
will go extinct. Um, but those are textbook kinds of solutions and nature is far more uh, malleable and complex. And we do know that the two species overlap pretty heavily in, in parts of Canada right now. Uh, so I would assume that the answer is no, but I, I can't say that with any certainty whatsoever. Thank you. Another one came in through chat from Zach. He says, Dr. Stoner, thank you for sharing your time and knowledge today. Uh, last week, it became public that a high percentage of deer in a Midwestern study have COVID antibodies and that three snow leopards died from COVID in a Midwestern zoo. Uh, so I was curious if you can give any insight into wild mountain lion populations being vulnerable to the virus and if any protective measures are implemented for ongoing field research where people are coming in close contact with wild mountain lions. Oh, oh that's a good one. Uh, yeah, the short answer is I, I don't know. Um, I, I doubt it. Um, there's been some really interesting research out of Colorado, uh, CSU on mountain lions and disease, not COVID specifically, uh, but some others that's, that have been transferred from feral house cats and things. Um, the whole COVID phenomenon is opening up right now. Um, there's going to be a lot of research in the coming decade on its, its varied impacts on wildlife. Um, I, I have not been following that real closely other than I'm doing a deer capture in a week and we were told to wear masks around the deer because they are susceptible to it. Um, but in terms of, of uh, uh, prophylactics or preventative measures for mountain lion captures, I, I'm not aware that anybody has, <laughs> has even thought about that yet. Um, but it's a very good question. I mean, the, the door is wide open on, on uh, the, the, the uh, spillover of disease from humans or from wildlife to humans and, and back again. So, uh, you know, we'll stay tuned. We'll see how this plays out. Well, I can ask a question and um, maybe give folks a chance to think of a few more here. Um, I have several questions, but one that kind of kept popping up for me during your presentation. And, and by the way, thanks again. That, that was great to, to hear all that information. So we really appreciate it, Dr. Stoner. You bet. Um, so one question that was popping up for me, it, it seems like there's there's more evidence all the time that there is this relationship between you know net primary productivity, deer abundance, and mountain lions. Um, and I was wondering, is there any either expectations on how that might impact mountain lion life history traits? Um, so like the timing of birth um, and things like that, or, or even research that's been done on those topics? Or yeah, do you have anything to comment on, on kind of how those translate to those changes? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question, Logan. Um, so I, I showed you that the fawning times as a function of of uh, the, the the plant phenology and, and when those plants are at their their maximum nutritional value and growth rates, um, there have been a number of studies done around the West on kitten production and when kittens are born. And the, the mountain lion's an interesting critter. I think part of its um, relative success um, in terms of just still being here in such abundance is. Um, they have a very malleable reproductive system. Uh, they are uh, the the birth pulse is tied to fawning, so they they come in about July and uh, June June through October is the pulse in most of the Mountain West, and this corresponds to when those neonatal deer are up and about and starting to forage and are available. And so we think of um, a new mother as needing a lot of food. Uh, to she's lactating as well, the, the, the mother mountain lion, and though she, she's got to support that lactation through a, a massive um, increase in her food intake. And fawns present a manageable, abundant, and safe resource. So the, the short answer is, I think, yes, any changes in the fawning 
period are probably going to be matched uh, by the kitten, kitten rearing period. Uh, we'll see how long that takes. You know, it is quite interesting. There's a lot of discussion right now about uh, what's been called trophic mismatch, where um, animal life histories um, have a particular rhythm and the, the, the environmental conditions are changing. Uh, we see this a lot with bird migrations um, and, and they're out of sync, but presumably uh, <laughs> they will get in sync or die. I mean, that, that's how it works. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that is probably um, a, a pretty safe prediction. Thank you. Looks like we might have another question. And yes, you can answer or ask questions verbally. Yeah. Um, all right. So Jim, um, if you're able to, uh, please ask your question. Hey, Jim, your microphone's turned off. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. awesome. Thank you very much, Dr. Stoner. Your presentation is amazing. And I wish I had been able to get online sooner. I couldn't get away from work in time. So my sincere apologies. I feel I've missed a great presentation, but I caught the end of it. I did my thesis at Oregon State University for my um, master's of natural resources and a master's grad certificate in sustainable natural resources and how cougar can mitigate Lyme disease. And in oh. Oregon, I, um, I had our, our medical coverage on a report of Lyme disease cases in Oregon, and I overlaid Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife's cougar harvest plan on it, they were an incredibly close um, proximity of each other. So in the areas in Oregon where there's been reported Lyme disease, we're some of the heaviest harvested areas for Oregon's cougar. And I'm wondering if you know if anyone else in the United States has picked up this uh, phenomena and is researching it. Um, I did my thesis on it. It was quite remarkable, and I really enjoyed the process of that and wanted to be able to share it with some colleagues. I know that the state of Pennsylvania has that research work, and the late Dr. Landre was extremely helpful with me in navigating that process, and Dr. Um, uh, Robert Betchka uh, also was very, very beneficial in helping me navigate the process of putting this thesis together. So I have really enjoyed your presentation and Thanks. wanted to find out what you have gleaned about how cougars sterilize the ecosystems and if that might be a way of mitigating pandemics and some of the consequences of climate change. Uh, boy, that's really interesting about Lyme's disease. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know. I've never even heard that before other than the correlation with deer abundance. Um, we had a student working with us that was working on Lyme's disease back east, I, I believe in Maryland or Pennsylvania. And uh, I learned a lot about ticks talking to him. <laughs> um, the deer, uh, yeah, I, I can't even go on to it. It's, it's just outside of my bailiwick, but um, I don't, I'm not aware of anyone that's looked at Lyme disease specifically. Uh, with respect to predation or deer abundance. It, it, uh, one thing I do have no, know of that's, that's of, of interest, and perhaps thematically related, was a really good study done out of Colorado about 10 years ago by Carolyn Crump, and she was looking at the prevalence of chronic wasting disease in, in New mm -hmm. yeah. And as it turned out that the background rates of chronic wasting disease was about 3%. So 3% of the deer they sampled were, were uh, infected with it. Um, but among the lion kills that they picked up, 20% had it. So there seemed to be some selection for these, uh, these diseased deer that were incapacitated by disease. Um, mm -hmm. and it, it, It begs the question of this, the eco ecosystem services provided by a uh, company like that. There's a lot that we don't know that we still have yet to learn on disease and um, predation. We know, you know historically our, our, our 
body of theory tells us that com individuals compromised in any way. Um, sorry, I'm reading something simultaneously. Um, are disproportionately vulnerable to predation. So the question of can a predator regulate the frequency of disease in, in let's say, a deer population, I think that's still wide open. Would there be a way I could send my thesis to you? I would really welcome your input on our discovery there that Dr. Landre myself and Dr. Betchta had at Oregon State. Um, I graduated in the middle of the pandemic, which was phenomenal. But um, I, would, I did hear about that student back in Pennsylvania, and I would be very interested in their findings as well. Yeah, he was looking at um, trying to correlate whole range size with deer density and therefore the frequency of Lyme's disease. And my understanding, and boy, this is pretty dusty now, is that the deer have gotten a bad rap. They are a vector and they carry it because of the ticks, but they really um, are not strongly implicated in the spread of the disease as, as we initially thought. But absolutely, send your thesis along. I'd love to read it. Um, my best friend did his master's under best. He's a hydrologist, um, not a wildlife person. But, uh, uh, Dr. Bestia, was, he's an amazing person. He was a lot of fun to do this research with. And I, I want to share real quick, and then I'll get off. I got that master's degree rather late in life. And I went back to college, and I was sitting at the commons table with Dr. Bechta, and we were talking about the outline of my program for the next five years. And a young man was listening in, and when Dr. Bechta left, the young man came up and asked me permission to communicate with me. And I said, well, sure. And the first thing out of his mouth was, he said, well, climate change must be really important for someone your age to come back to school. <laughs> it was the best thing he ever could have said, and most welcome, actually. So I just thought I'd share that with you. Yeah, I was I was in my forties when I finished my dissertation. So I, I was in my sixties. Okay, well, you, you got me beat, but uh, nevertheless, <laughs> better late than never. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Send it along. You can uh, my email is available through the uh, through the university website. Yeah, okay, which is, okay, I'll do that. And thank you very much for your time. There are a lot of good questions here, so I'm going to back over to all the parties involved and thank you very much dr stoner yeah my pleasure well since that slides up maybe we'll give folks just a couple more moments here to think if they have any final questions um while we're doing that i just wanted to thank you again dr stoner for this excellent presentation um i feel like it's it's an interesting species to think about in the context of climate change you know your examples of the pika and the polar bear, you hear a lot about those in the world of climate change and how it relates to wildlife. But um, I just found it fascinating that the mountain lion has so many implications for things like human conflict and, you know, kind of indicating what's happening to other species. Um, so I really appreciated that context. And thank you for breaking it down in such a digestible way for all of us. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, this is uh, it's it's a great question. And uh, as I say, I, I wish I could provide better answers for it. We have a lot to learn still. There's, it's a really, you know, the species that occurs in all these different systems, it's the, the con, it, you know, I think about the, the old um, metaphor of the four scientists that are blind trying to describe an elephant. And, and that's really what a lot of us are. We're, we're in our own systems and we find this over here and that over there. And maybe they mesh, and maybe not. Uh, there's, um, a tremendous amount left to, left to learn about these these critters. Well, we're excited to learn more and to see future research. I know you've been working on more papers on similar topics and, and even re recently released one. So looking yeah. forward to learning more. Yeah. Um, so with that, uh, thank you all so much for being here. I just want to remind folks uh, we have, this is the first of several webinars we hope to do on the topic of cougars and climate. So. Um, we are currently hoping to set up more here soon and, and hope that you all check back for more of these opportunities. 
Um, as well, you can go to mountainlion.org slash climate and check out a new story map that we just prepared on um, some of the relationships between cougars and climate change as well. So we just wanted to throw that out there for folks. Um, so with that, I will let folks go and enjoy the rest of their afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. And Dr. Stoner, again, thank you so much. We appreciate it. My pleasure. All right. Take care.